Happy New Year. Feliz Año Nuevo. How are you guys doing? ¿Cómo están ustedes? Se ve muy bien. Estamos en la casa de Dios y estamos contentos de estar con ustedes acá. Este es mi amigo Luke y Andrew y vamos a tomar un tiempo para adorar a Dios. Y vamos a cantar algunas canciones viejas y nuevas también y vamos a enfocarnos en quién es Dios y qué ha hecho en nuestras vidas. Y vamos a invitarle a que venga a nuestras vidas y que cambie nuestra perspectiva. Y que antes de cantar, que a lo mejor no conoce, hay gente alrededor tuya que no conoce, dile feliz año nuevo, salúdalo.
Say 
Amazing Grace one more time. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that Padre, estamos aquí en esta noche. Estamos uh, humillados delante de ti. Gracias por tu misericordia, Señor. De que tú nos has visto en la condición en la que estábamos. Y nosotros te amamos, yo te amo. Y puede hacer la diferencia en nuestras vidas. Y muchos de nosotros han sido, hemos sido tocados por tu palabra, por tu Espíritu Santo. Y somos producto de tu gracia. Tú nos has ayudado a, a ver y podemos verte. Podemos ver tu bondad. Podemos ver tu amor, tu paciencia. Podemos ver tu misericordia y tu gracia. Así es que, Padre, estamos aquí y por muchos de nosotros hemos sido interrumpidos en nuestra semana, pero hemos venido aquí y estamos en tu presencia. Y sabemos, Señor, que cuando abramos la palabra, Tú nos vas a hablar fielmente. Y Tu palabra es poderosa y nunca va a retornar vacía. No hay un esfuerzo eh, que pueda... Eh, y Tú nos vas a transformar por el poder de Tu palabra y por el Espíritu Santo. Y te damos gracias por esto. Y oramos de que nuestro corazón hoy pueda ser... Eh, blando y listo para la palabra que tú tienes para nosotros. Y te invitamos en esta noche que nos encuentres aquí, que vengas a nuestra, que venga, bendigas este tiempo y te lo pedimos todo en el nombre de Jesús. Y todos los, los creyentes dicen, amén. Dios les bendiga. Buenas noches. Happy New Year. Estoy contento de verlos de nuevo. Si tienen su Biblia, Vamos a ir a Hebreos, capítulo 1. Y yo sé lo que van a decir. Estamos en la mitad de Corintios, sí, la próxima semana. Una semana más. Tenemos un mensaje especial en esta noche. Y vamos a dar la bienvenida a los que nos ven online. Y estamos uh, dando un swing de vida. Eh, tenemos un poquito más de vacaciones, de las vacaciones que ya cogimos. Quisiera decirle algunas cosas. Uh, eh, tenemos uh, un ministerio de uh, solteros, bien vibrante con Pastor Andrea, que se reúnen a través de la semana y cada cuarto de, me, de, de, de cada trimestre se reúnen también a las seis y media se reúnen hay una gran oportunidad de entrar en la palabra de poder conocer otros solteros aquí en la iglesia y tú como soltero cuál es mi punto cuál es mi, mi, mi puesto aquí en la iglesia quisiera hacer alguna comunidad yo quisiera decirte que esta es una buena oportunidad para hacer comunidad en estos grupos no hay 30 años en adelante, puedes venir. Es un tiempo extraordinario en la palabra. Si ese eres tú o si conoces a alguien, nos gustaría verte el viernes a las seis y media, este viernes a las seis y media. Y el sábado vamos a hacer algo especial, algo después del servicio. Vamos a orar una vez al mes, el primer sábado del mes. Después del servicio, y este mes, vamos a enfocar, vamos a orar por las naciones. No sé, pero si ven a través del, del globo terráqueo, hay bastantes cosas ocurriendo. Hay uh, muchas cosas locas pasando. Y vamos a orar 
va, vamos a orar por Perú, en China, en Brasil, en los Estados Unidos. Vamos a unirnos el sábado a las 8 y vamos a orar en el servicio que si tú típicamente no vienes, es un servicio que te invitamos para que asista. Es un tiempo muy importante para que el cuerpo de Cristo se reúne y que podamos nosotros uh, postrarnos a los pies de Jesús y, y orar. Así es que les invitamos para que vengan y podamos... Uh, y el último anuncio es para ti. ¿Cuánto de ustedes les gusta uh, el puerco? ¿De verdad? ¿Cuánto, ¿Cuánto a usted le gusta el bacon, el, los puer, el puerco? Ok. Eh, vamos a tener el, el 12 aniversario del puerco que nosotros siempre eh, cocinamos. Eh, el lunes 16, no este próximo lunes, sino el próximo va a ser el anual vamos a cocinar el por 12 años hemos hecho esto hemos cocinado estos puercos si quieres venir ese día y el siguiente lunes vamos a comenzar el estudio bíblico el próximo no este próximo lunes sino el de arriba 7 dólares cuesta el plato gran oportunidad para invitar a un amigo. Si tienes un amigo en tu vida por el cual has estado orando, es una oportunidad para invitarlo. A veces las personas, o oh, yo no sé si quiero ir a la iglesia, si es lo que yo quiero hacer, ¿por qué no vienes? Vamos a, a tener un tiempo extraordinario en el Señor. ¿Por qué no vienes? Si quieren extender esta invitación y confiar en Dios de que el Señor pueda hacer la obra en la vida de, estos, de estas personas que van a venir. Tenemos un invitado en esta noche. Este hombre ha sido un amigo mío por 18, 19, 20 años. Hemos sido amigos. Él y yo no conozco muchos hombres que amen la palabra y la conozcan tal, tanto como Él. Así es, que, así es que nos estamos enfocando hoy en Hebreos, capítulo 1. Hebreos, capítulo 1. Él vive en North Carolina. Él necesita venir a Florida. Así es que ha estado aquí por algunas uh, semanas. Yo quisiera que vinieras y... Yo quisiera bendecir a Greg Yuhas. El título del mensaje en esta noche, Ningún Hijo Ordinario. Vamos a estar hablando de Hebreos, capítulo 1, del 1 al 4. Hubo una confusión entre Hebreos 11... No sé, pero uh, creo que fue mi equivocación. Pero vamos a ir a Hebreos capítulo 1, versículo del 1 al 4. Y vamos a hacer cosas, el libro, un poquito diferentes esta noche de las que hacemos usualmente. Así es que pon tu dedo en la Biblia. Eh, Jerry me dijo que solamente tenía una hora y 45 minutos 45 minutos por esta ya yeah. oh ok ok aló aló dime oh la dejas acá It will be 22 years since at the mothership 22 years ago. Greg Howard was teaching. I remember it to this day. He, <laughs> Greg Howard used to be a model. If you didn't know that, he was a model. And he was doing this incredible illustration that night as he's talking about walking down the runway and bobbing his head. And I'm sitting in the chair in the back corner of Calvary Fort Lauderdale going, who is this fool? And 
20 or 30 minutes later, I was bobbing my head, walking down the aisle where I got to the front and I was introduced to my very best friend. And he changed everything about my life. I also have deep ties to this campus, and um, some of you may have been wondering what happened to me. Where did you go? <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still alive. I still love Jesus, um, but I am also tired of a lot of what I'm seeing in this world today. Like Jerry said, I I'm out of God's will. I don't live here any longer. I'm in the wonderful state of North Carolina. But constantly I run into people every single day. They're people who used to, right? They used to love Jesus. They used to study their Bible. They used to serve him. They used to be sitting next to us here. But for some reason, whether it's an issue of their own or maybe an issue in the church, But for some reason, they've walked away. And I'm so very tired of it. And, I, and I'm very tired of it because, quite honestly, I, I believe I may know why some people are walking away. People are walking away, listen, because the very foundation of their faith is being shaken. And we must ask this one question. What will we build or rebuild on. In other words, if our faith is being shaken, what will we build or rebuild our faith on? What works needs to be done to our foundation so that we can have stability in the coming years if reconstruction is really needed. I have a, a friend, he's an architect, and he's retired now, but he used to build skyscrapers in Chicago and New York. And he can tell you what happens to skyscrapers if their foundation is not stable. He can also tell you about building in the 90s in New York where, let's just say, the criminal element was pretty active and it was a lot of fun those days. <laughs> but he is someone with his knowledge and experience as building skyscrapers to the ceiling or several stories up that if the foundation is not stable, what happens to that building. And he can also tell you what happens to a family if its foundation is not stable, as he did his best 20 years ago to ruin his. But God is gracious, and my friend now spends all of his life going around telling as many people as would hear how God can restore his family as he has done. Recently, my father and I were watching a documentary on Notre Dame, and this is Notre Dame, the cathedral in France, not here. And recently, there was a fire there a few years ago, and we're watching this documentary about how they are restoring and reconstructing the cathedral back to its prior glory. And the amazing thing about this was how much time and effort had to go in to supporting the foundation in order that the structure could be rebuilt. So friends, what are you going to stand on in the coming trials? Because they are coming. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. And I would argue that, heading to, that we are heading to some of the most unknown times in history. So we need a foundation that will last. So I have deep ties to Calvary Fort Lauderdale, I have deep ties to this campus, and I have deep ties to your pastor. Um, Jerry and I have been friends for about 18 years. Um, and I would argue that our friendship is based on two addictions. Ready? Here's the first one. <laughs> Jerry and I have a deep addiction to coffee, but apparently he's been working on his addiction and mine's getting worse. <laughs> The other day, Jerry was like, yeah, I'm down to only one or two cups a day. And I'm like, pots a day? Hey, I'm not putting bourbon in it yet, okay? That's <laughs> kidding. It's a joke. But Jerry and I both have an addiction to coffee, and we have also a deep addiction to the Word of God. 
Friends, I'm outing your pastor tonight. <laughs> your pastor has a deep love for God's word. And hear this. That is rare these days. Hear this. A love for the purity of God's word is rare these days. So when my good friend Jerry asked me to teach tonight, we felt that the very best thing for us to do was to see if we can get you all excited about my best friend, as he is someone you definitely want to know. And he is the key to having an immovable foundation in this life and the life to come. For those of you not following, <laughs> I am talking about God. Yes, God. God is my BFF. Now, you may sit there and say, that's so arrogant. How can you say that God is your best friend? And I would argue that if you think that, you may not know this God very well. He is the friend of sinners. And I am the chief. <laughs> He is my best friend, not because I am special. I am not. He is my best friend because he is the best. Hear that. He's not my best friend because I'm special. He's the superlative. He is my best friend because he is the best at everything. He is the best person who has ever lived. He is the best person who, has, who will ever live. He's my best friend, and he wants to be yours, too. So my goal for tonight is to encourage you, listen and hear this, it's to encourage you to get to know God deeper by getting you excited to deeply study this amazing word of God in front of us. And who knows, maybe he will become your best friend too. So please turn with me to Hebrews chapter one. We're gonna look at verses one through four. Put your finger there, and in a few minutes, I'm going to ask us to stand up, and we will read Scripture and pray. Um, but before, let's start with a little story about some missionaries. Several years ago, over in the Middle East, this is hundreds of years ago, prior to technology, out in the rural area of the Middle East, there was a group of missionaries. And these missionaries were, well, God's hand was upon them and they were working miracles everywhere. And friends, this is what you need to hear. Be very careful, because there are a lot of false miracle workers out there. Some who are nothing more than charlatans trying to get your profits <laughs> while claiming to be a prophet. But remember, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And, we, and just because someone has the appearance of supernatural power, does not mean that they are from God. Janice and Jambres were able to recreate some of the miracles of Moses. So we need to be very careful when we hear stories of miracles that they are connected to the true and living God and not just foolery or worse. But that was not the case here. This story is documented and I would argue can be proven. These missionaries were healing everyone Everyone was coming to them, and it was causing a stir in their community. Then one day, a villager who had a son who was sick heard about these missionaries. And so this man traveled around one day looking for these miracle workers as he saw them as the only hope for his son. And glorious was the moment when this man found those missionaries at the bottom of a mountain where they had been serving people and waiting for the rest of their group to return. As this father brought his son to these missionaries, they all began to pray, and amazingly, nothing. And again and again, they began to pray, and what happened? Nothing. And beginning to get frustrated, they fought amongst themselves, and they began to pray again. And this time, when nothing happened, that father was left hopeless. As they fought amongst themselves, he 
had nowhere else to go. This was the last hope for his son and these missionaries. You see, these missionaries had lost connection to the very one who had gifted them their power. And in this villager's time of need, when his son needed a miracle, he was brought to the missionaries But what had happened. Look, I know we all want to hear these amazing stories of this child being healed, but I, I'm just the messenger. I didn't remove the power. The last three years for many people have been a living hell. And I will not mention everything that I have been going through because quite honestly, I'm not that important, right? And, and if I were up here starting to tell you what I had been going through over the past few years, here's what would happen. One of you out there would have a thousand worse things going on than me. So you'd be like, hey, hold my beer. You think you got issues? And you'd start going down your list. What would happen is immediately I'd be like, Dude, my issues aren't that bad. That person needs Jesus. And I, immediately, I would feel shame for the weight of the troubles I've been going through for the past few years. So I don't want to tell you what's been going on because I know some of you are going through worse right now. Well, what's the other thing that would happen is others would say, holy cow, you've been going through all of this? You're some kind of saint. And again, I would say, talk to my sister. She'll tell you clearly I am not. I don't want either to happen because we are all responsible for our own lives before God. Think about 2 Corinthians 12 where the apostle Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh. And I have, I would argue, read all of the positions on what is the thorn in Paul's flesh. And here is the scholarly debate on that conclusion. Nobody knows. <laughs> no one knows what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. No one. And, and I love that. You know why? Because it leaves me free to think, right? So here's what I would love to think will happen to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. I'm hoping it's something simple like a stub toe. Seriously. Like I hope in 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul talks about this ailment, it's something so silly that it's a stub toe. You know why? Because I feel like I lose my salvation every time somebody cuts me off in traffic. And I don't want to hear Paul's ailment as some terrible, hard thing. I want to hear that, like me, he struggles. Because, friends, listen, what happens in that goes on to say that Paul says that I prayed for this thorn to be taken away. Three times I prayed, but it wasn't. And what did he learn? That in his weakness, God was made strong. And what's important is in our weaknesses, no matter what they are, a stub toe or cancer in our weaknesses, no matter what they are, a lost job or a lost loved one in our weaknesses, no matter what they are, he is strong when we are weak. Suffering is common to man and it's coming. The Bible promises it for those who pursue God. So the question, how will we endure the next three years if they were anything like the last three for some of us? My uh, home church up in North Carolina, we're going through the book of Job. And so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions here, right? When you get the news one day that a loved one is dying or has just passed, will you be shaken? When a relationship that you thought was going to last forever, that marriage or that son or daughter, the son or daughter who was once so close, but now it's divorce and silence. Will you be shaken? When you get a phone call that your granddaughter's house and her baby, your great grandchild was lost in a fire. Will your foundation stand? When you wake up one day and your health is gone, which means your business is now in jeopardy, taken away in one day, will you curse God? Or will you be like Job who said, though he slay me, I will trust in him? Because friends, listen and, and hear this. We do not live our best lives here and now 
We beg Jesus to redeem and to utilize the best years of our lives here and now so that we don't waste our lives throughout all of eternity. You hear that? Let me, let me say that again because this is important. We do not live our best lives here and now. We beg Jesus to redeem and to utilize the best years of our lives here and now so that we don't waste our lives in all of eternity. And friends, listen, this is true if you are seven or 70. It is never too late. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be when the lamp of my life was burned out for thee. Whether you're 70 or seven, you could start that today. Now, friends, this only happens when we stay connected to the power of our lives by abiding in Jesus, and we abide in him by staying deeply grounded in his word. We connect to the God of this word by deeply loving and embracing the word of this amazing God. So if you would please stand and let's read Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 and actually get into the study. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, who has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the power of his word, when he himself purged our sins, set down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has, by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. For, Lord, in it we have the bread of life. And, Savior, we thank you so much for your son. For as he was gifted to us to free us of our sins and give us purpose and meaning, here and now and for all of eternity. Lord, we ask that he would be present, that your spirit would move, that he would be in this room. And Father, that he would establish a love for your word that grounds us in a foundation so that no matter what comes in this year or the years to come, Lord, like Job, we all will be able to say, though you slay, we trust. Because, Father, you are trustworthy. We love you, Lord. It's in your precious name. Amen. All right. Have a seat, please. So when you study the Bible, context is the second or third most important thing. <laughs> I don't have time to go into hermeneutics tonight, but context is so important when studying the Bible. And there are multiple forms of context. Okay, one you're typically familiar with that pastors do an excellent job often of speaking through is what we call the literary context. And that's the paragraph above, the paragraph below. It's the context of the words around the verses that we are reading. And it's important to know context to keep the Bible in context, right? But the second thing that's important to understand is also what we call cultural context. You see, the Bible was written to a specific people at a specific time. And here's the secret. We weren't around then, all right? It was 2,000 years ago. And so we need an understanding of the culture that they were reading it in to fully grasp the weight of what we're seeing here. So in Hebrews, we have this letter that was written to the early church. It was written by a church leader that's debatable at this time. I don't have time to get into the potential authorship of Hebrews, but it was written to the early church. So there would have been Jews and Gentiles present. All right. And the Jews, well, they had scripture and the Gentiles, well, they would have had not Bible scripture, but they still would have understood through traditions and nature, this idea of a God. Think Romans chapter one, when you have time, go back there. Okay. So 
the Jews had scripture, the Gentiles had their traditions and this idea passed down about supernatural things happening. So both would have been familiar and both would have been aware of the buzz surrounding this man, Jesus. But the Jews would have had a very special context for these opening verses in Hebrews. See, the Jews were very familiar with the Old Testament prophets, and we may not be as familiar with them these days. You see, prior to Jesus coming on the scene, there were 400 years of silence. Then God began to move from Malachi to John the Baptist. There was silence, the intertestamental period, and then God began to move. And this man, Jesus, shows up on the scene, and miracles are happening again, and hope for redemption of the land is beginning to spread. But then he's killed, and there are rumors that he rose from the dead, and now you're at this church, the first church of Hebrews, and you're trying to figure out what's going on. Why did this one who produced so much power not save all of us? Friends, these are the questions going on in the first early church. As they were reading this for the first time. They're going, hey, this Jesus guy, he showed up. He's doing all these miracles, and he dies and goes away. Why didn't he save all of us? What is happening here? And this is in the reader's mind as they're hearing this letter for the first time. Let's talk about one more thing here that you may not see clearly in your Bibles when you're reading this in the English Bible. Um, but the word his there, you see that word his in your Bible? You see how it's in italics? Right? It, it's in italics because it wasn't there in the original language. Okay? The word his was added by translators to help us understand the context of that word. Why is that important? Well, it literally says a son. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Okay? It's important to know these things because your kids are going to go off to college in a few years. And they're going to meet a guy or they're going to get introduced at a religion class to a book by a guy named Bart Ehrman. And Bart Ehrman is a professor up near me and he is a very gifted speaker. He's a very nice man and he will lead your kids directly away from the Bible if they don't know how to answer some of these questions. And it's simple to understand that what's happening here are the translators are adding things in to help us understand what is happening. But Bart will go, look, look, point out right there. Look, look, see, that they're changing your Bible. And if we don't educate people on how these things work, when they get to college, they're gone. It'll be bankrupt. That's why it's important to know. So literally, the translation here says this. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke, now, let's just pause there for a minute to realize that we have an active God who speaks. He's not a deist. He is not quiet. He is speaking all the time, whether it's through nature or through his word. But we have a God who speaks. Do you have ears to hear? But literally, this text here would say, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by a son. A son. Literally, this says a son. The his was added for us to better understand this. But you say, wait, God has more than one son? Read your Bible. <laughs> right? John 1, 12, right? For as many as received him, they have the right to be called the children of God. So what is happening here? This is what I'm trying to get your attention to. What is happening here? The insertion of the his it isn't inaccurate, but it may remove the intent of the original author if we don't do a little work. Because what is happening here is a comparison that is supposed to lead the original readers into some very interesting memories. And it's a comparison of the prophets of old and the way God used to speak with this particular son. You see, here's the comparison. God is now speaking through a son, but this is no ordinary son. This son is supremely more valuable than any other being who has or will ever exist. 
So for the rest of our time here, we're going to take a look at some Old Testament prophets. Then we're going to come back to Hebrews 1, and we're going to see what makes this one son so very foundational to our lives and how this son can be the foundation that will stabilize us for whatever this crazy world throws at us in the coming months. All right? So let's paint the scene again, and I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but I want to bring you to this place. Remember, you're a first century Jew or Gentile. You're familiar with the stories of the Old Testament prophets, some more than others. But now there's this Christian movement coming across the land. You get invited to a church, and the speaker pulls out a scroll. He says, we have a new writing from one of our church leaders. Let's read it together. And as the words are being read, if I were there and I heard God who spoke in the prophets of old, immediately my brain would have went to 1 Kings 17. And you don't have to turn there for the sake of time. But in 1 Kings 17, we have the history of the kings of Israel and we meet this evil king named Ahab. And out of the blue, the Bible says Elijah, Elijah, the Tishbite, shows up on the scene. And he looks right at the king and says, hey king, you're wicked. It ain't going to rain anymore. Huh. Now, I remember, you're a first century Christian. And you know of these prophets that used to walk up to the king and tell them to shut up, basically. And you're under oppression because of the Romans and what's happening in, all around you. And you're going, God, why don't you send one of these? I, I mean, imagine for a moment, just prophet showing up to the White House like, Now, Elijah tells Ahab it's not going to rain, and then he disappears. He's just gone. A few days later, a few weeks later, the timing's unsure, but Elijah runs into this prophet named Obadiah, and Obadiah sees Elijah and says, hey, you need to go to Ahab. And Elijah's like, all right, I'll show up. And Obadiah goes, wait, no, you come with me right now because I'm going to go tell him, and if you don't show up, he's going to kill me. And Elijah says, don't worry about it. I'll show up. And Elijah goes and meets Ahab, and Ahab goes, hey, troubler of Israel. And what does Elijah say? Elijah says, no, you are the trouble of Israel, and we need one of these guys or girls today, I would argue. And yes, there were female prophets in the Old Testament. Please read that too. But imagine if we had one of these prophets today take a trip to D.C., what that would look like. Oh, like imagine this prophet shows up at the Congress, and every time Nancy Pelosi tries to speak, the prophet goes, hmm, and this little cloud comes over her head. Every time she lies, lightning, zap. Look, or the prophet then goes down to the Senate, right, and meets our buddy Mitch McConnell. And imagine for a moment this prophet makes it so that Mitch McConnell can't lie. Like think Jim Carrey in the Liar Liar movie and just just imagine this scene, right? This, just think about this, right? So, Mr. McConnell, how much money are you making on all those wars? Well, you know, I'm I'm actually not making any money, but my wife, she's making... Think about it. Friends, this is the context for the first century readers of this letter. They were under terrible oppression. They were under persecution. And they saw and heard about this guy working miracles. And then he went away. And they're like, did we miss the glory? What's going on? And then they read this letter and they say, well, he's no longer speaking through prophets like he did. He's just going to speak through a son. We don't have a ton of time. um, Or I would also tell you about the amazing history of the prophet Ezekiel. He wrote of amazing visions of God's throne, of Eden, of God himself. God used him as a living parable, often calling him to do these crazy tasks. It would be like Elijah go lay, or excuse me, Ezekiel go lay on your side for like half a year and then go lay on your other side for like a few months 
And while you're laying on your side, I want you to eat food that you make out of manure. I, we may actually have some of these people today. I think you find them on TikTok but I'm a boomer, so I don't know too much about them. And I'm pretty sure they're not telling God's messages. <laughs> but again, put yourself in the first century situation and knowing these amazing ways that God spoke. And now he's saying, I'm speaking to you solely through a son. Now, I don't have any kids. Um, I have a nephew. I don't think he's here. He is a son. Um, he's actually pretty cool. But he's definitely not a prophet. He does seem to acquire a lot of our family's profits. That's F-I-T-S, not P-H-E-T-S. Apparently, kids are expensive. Um, don't have to worry about that. <laughs> but, I, I t but as cool and as awesome as my nephew is, I sure would not choose him over Elijah or Ezekiel in a time of real need. But God gifted us a son. And so let's finish our time tonight by seeing what makes this particular son so much more valuable than any other person who has or ever lived. And in doing so, let's get excited about what this son will be doing in and among his church in the coming years. Hebrews chapter one. We'll be done quickly, I promise. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had himself purged our sins, set down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. How is this son, no ordinary son, how is this son so much greater than the prophets of old, so much greater than every other being who has or will ever existed? Well, the first thing I see is that he is the heir of all things in verse 2. And this word all here, it means all. Here's a little thing. When you're, when you're reading the Bible and you think about context, all doesn't always mean all. And, and let me explain. Like, if I were to say all of Calvary Boca, right, what does that mean? Well, is it all of everyone who's ever attended here? Is it all of everyone who calls this place their church home? Or is it all of everyone here tonight? Now, all three of those statements could be true, and the context will tell us, okay? But here, this all means all. Jesus is the heir. This son is the heir of all things. What did you get for Christmas? You think you got something, didn't you? Well, the answer is we really got nothing because Jesus gets that too. But he loves us so much that he gifts us with stewardship of this wonderful world, right? In verse two, we also see that he made the world. He is not only the heir of all things, he is the creator of all things. He creates to display his beauty and for his glory. And he created each one of us to reflect that glory. If you have questions about your identity, about your gender, about your value, about your marriage, then I would humbly suggest including your very creator's wisdom into those decisions. It at least makes the most logical sense for me. Verse three, we see he is the brightness of God's glory. The prophets were used by God, but they were not God. They were like us. You see, James literally says in James 5, it says that Elijah was isosuke. The word isosuke, literally, it's same soul as you or I. And he prayed and the rain stopped. Elijah was of the same nature as you and I. Not this son. This son is the express image of his person. 
Sorry. It's the brightness of his glory. I missed that one. <laughs> um, he is the brightness of his glory. Elijah, like Iso Suke, prayed. He's the same soul as us, and we are flawed just like him. When we try to display God's glory, we constantly pollute it with our own sin and failures. But this son, not this son, he is the brightness of God's glory. James says, with him there is no shadow or variance of turning. Pure, bright light. Verse 3, we also read that he is the express image of his person. Now, this little verse here among the rest piled in here may be the greatest divisor between the prophets or basically anyone and this particular son. You see, this son, he is the exact nature as God. This verse here is a direct reference to the divinity of Jesus. It's why the translator adds the his genitive here. It's not wrong to add that. You just need to understand that it was added. And then it has clarity. So when Bart Ehrman tries to tell it to your kids, you could give them a ready answer like Peter tells us to. Now think about why this is important and do not miss this. Here's a clue. We are not God. We are his creations. The prophets were not God, they were his creation. How can a God who himself, so to speak, became a man, excuse me, how can a God who is so distinct and separate from us, his creation, communicate with us? Well, he translated himself, so to speak, and became a man, lowering himself in a way so that we could communicate with him on, on our level. Think about that. It's, I don't have time to get into that. But God became a man so that we could communicate with him on his level because he became our level. He is like no other son. Verse 3, we see that he is the sustainer of all things. I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but God sustains the world through his word. And science is finally catching up to this. Recently, three Nobel Prize or three physicists just won the Nobel Prize over something called quantum entanglement. I don't have time to get into that tonight, but here is what physics is saying. Ready? This is fun. Physics is saying that our reality is way more like a sound wave than actual particles. Can you say that again? Physics is saying that the little atoms, the Protons, electrons, neutrons, remember those things that you used to have to study in high school, that they don't actually operate like particles, like they thought, they operate like sound waves. And in Genesis 1, we heard that God spoke and the word world came into existence, and science is finally starting to see that. Colossians 1.17 says, in him, all things are held together. If your world is falling apart, listen, the next fancy five or six step process will not help you. Jesus will. Verse three, we see that he is the purger of our sins. He's not solely the creator who became like a creation in order to communicate with us. But he's the humble servant who sacrificed himself in our place so that we can not just communicate with him, but also commune with this holy God. You see, he is no ordinary son. Then in verse 3 to 4, he sat down at the right hand of God, sitting in perfect authority. But this begs the question, where is he? Where is he? Look at our world and look at the state of our churches. Look at the state of my life, you may say. Look at the state of my family. Where is he? I cry out and I don't see him. I don't hear him. We're going to close by returning to the little missionary story. You see, after arguing amongst themselves for some time, the leader of those nine missionary men returned 
with their three other missionaries. And when the leader saw the commotion of the crowd, he was distraught and rebuked the missionaries. And he said, oh, faithless generation, how long will I bear with you? Bring him to me. See, those missionaries were no ordinary missionaries. They were Jesus' first 12 disciples. And when Jesus and three of them went up on a mountain for a little while, nine of them were left to do ministry in his stead. And they failed to stay connected to his power and they became ineffective in their ministry, but only for a season until their master returned. He is not sitting there, friends. I, I, I mean, he is. <laughs> but he is also in us, his church. We are his body on earth here and now. Are we being effective in ministry? Friends, as we close up here tonight, um, are you still connected to that power? Are you still connected to my best friend, Jesus? Or have the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of sin caused a chasm between him and you? Well, if that's the case, be encouraged. I do not believe that God is done with you yet. I do not believe that God is done with your family yet, or this church yet, or this world just yet. And maybe, just maybe, what we're seeing across this land is the rumbling of God waiting to move and rebuild or reconstruct his beautiful body, known as the bride of Christ, his church. And, and maybe, just maybe, it will begin when each of us in here see the real beauty of this unordinary son and then devote our lives to knowing him in the words of this beautiful love letter gifted to us, we take for granted each day. There is a hope for tomorrow and there is a solid foundation for us to stand on. It is grounded in the word of God, being loved and fed by the spirit of God and being an active part of the body of God, encouraging one another daily, redeeming the time because the time is evil. I'm gonna close in prayer. Um, if you have had a challenging year or few years, and maybe you are someone who used to have a love for God's word. Maybe you're in here and you're someone who used to have family members who are sitting next to you and they're no longer there. Friends, it's okay. Jesus is in control. He is sitting at the right hand of majesty on high, and he is waiting for time for his church to move. What is keeping us back? Father, we thank you so much for your word. For Father, in it we find the words of life. Savior, I just want to pray for anyone in this room who has been struggling and challenged and beat up by this world. Father, might you put in them a passion and a hunger to know you. Because, Father, it is in you that we find fullness of joy. Savior, I pray for anyone in here who is sick and hurting and needs wisdom and doctors and medicine and help. Father, we ask that you will bring around them love and encouragement from your church. Savior, I pray for the churches across this nation. Lord, as numbers have dwindled, as challenges arise, Father, might you rebuild and restore your beautiful bride again. 
We love you, Savior. It is in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. You're dismissed? <laughs> hey, we're going to have some prayer counselors. I think Jerry's around. I'll be down here up front. Andrea, Pastor Dave will be here. Please do not waste an opportunity to be encouraged by prayer for your soul. Um, there is something very special about walking this life with brothers and sisters. You cannot do it alone. If you are in need, please do not leave without meeting Pastor Dave or Jerry or someone up here. Thank you all so much. We will see you Saturday. I'm sorry I'm missing that pig roast. Next year, maybe we could do beef ribs. I will come for that. We need a tithe bucket so we can get beef ribs instead of the pork. Is that how it works? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you all so much. We love you. Have a wonderful night. You are dismissed. <laughs>